I'm guessing you might have seen things are a little tight around here. We're sort of on the edge of a construction zone. So I apologize for any crampness that was on the reception. And uh, I would say this is for a very good purpose. They are working on building our new building. So please, everyone come back in one year for the next Tents and Time Lecture, and you can see our new digs. Okay, I want to just say a couple of special welcomes before I bring down uh, the official university opener. Um, we have several alumni here. I've tried to meet as many as I could in the last hour. Um, welcome back to UConn, and we're glad to see you. Go pester your old professors. Um, several high school students I know are here, um, so I hope you get inspired and we see you in physics here at UConn in a couple of years. Uh, I want a special shout out just because it's personal. Um, one of our alums, Christy Basiaga, is here with her class from Glastonbury High School, which I want to mention because it's my own town, and my son will be there in a couple of years. So, welcome. <laughs> and with that, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Jeffrey Scholson, who is our Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and he's going to do some introductions on behalf of the university. Thanks for that promotion. And actually, that was a good, a good one. It's my honor to represent my boss, the provost, Greg Kennedy here. I'm vice provost, but I, I, I appreciate the, uh, <laughs> the promotion. Um, I'm very glad to be here and to welcome you to the University of Connecticut, those of us, those of you who are visiting, and to uh, welcome you all here to the to the Katz uh, 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 team lecture. Today's lecture occurs in the midst of an exciting period for the university, a decade or so of remarkable expansion or growth, and as uh, Dr. Wells just pointed out, you can sort of feel physically how that growth is going on right now. By every measure from student diversity to research grants, from admission selectivity to faculty profiles, UConn has been steadily enhancing its standing in the national and international community of higher education. Thanks to an unprecedented commitment from the state of Connecticut and the visionary leadership of its presidents and board of trustees, UConn attracts internationally renowned faculty and some of the world's brightest students, many of them sitting in this room right now. Uh, we are one of the top public research universities in the nation, and in just 20 years, the university's ranking by U.S. News and World Report, for whatever it's worth, and I know those rankings are somewhat arbitrary. Um, uh, among public universities has risen from 38 in 1998 to 22 this past year. And we're not done yet. Uh, the years ahead will certainly present their challenges, but they are also filled with opportunities, especially opportunities for us to build on our current strengths in fields that are increasingly redefining themselves and demonstrating just how much they have to teach us about our world and ourselves, like physics. The physics department is a vibrant community of faculty graduate students and undergraduates working in cutting edge research fields, including atomic molecular and optical physics, condensed matter and solid state physics, nuclear and particle physics, laser physics, polymer physics, and material science. The department has strong collaborative links to other institutes and programs at UConn, such as the Institute of Material Sciences and uh, the polymer program, as well as significant ties with uh, external institutions like the Harvard Smithsonian Institute for Theoretical Atomic and Molecular Physics, the Brookhaven National Laboratory, Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Argonne National Laboratory, and the SLAC National Accelerator, Lab Acceler Accelerator Laboratory, to name a few. An event like this offers us an opportunity to acknowledge not only the achievements of our faculty and students, but also to express also to express our thanks to the department's generous supporters, especially the Katzenstein family, who have made lecture series like this one so critical to its intellectual life and annual highlight. I'm pleased to, mark this, to be marking this occasion with you. We welcome visitors and alumni and hope you will return many more times in the coming years as UConn continues to grow 
And now it's my pleasure to call on my colleague, Dr. Philip Mannheim, who will introduce this year's Capstan Steam Lecture. Oh, here we go. We have one more thing to uh, talk to you about. Because this is the Katzenstein Lecture, I think we should tell you just a bit of who was Henry Katzenstein. So, we have these pictures. The usual one we have all the time is this one on the left here. Uh, um, we like it because he looks so happy and enthused, right? That looks like one of your professors who just thinks he made a really good point in his lecture. <laughs> uh, I like the one on the right because you know, look at that young, good-looking guy there, and uh, with his wife. And we want to say just a little bit about who he was. So first and foremost, to us, Henry Katzenstein was the very first PhD recipient from our department here at UConn. So that in itself is quite, you know, puts you in the lore of any place. Okay, and. Uh, Henry, you know, he attended Bird High School, he was an undergraduate student at Duke, and then World War II broke out, and he joined the Navy, uh, worked on radar. Um, and after the Navy, uh, after that, in 1951, a few years later, he presented his military discharge papers to UConn, uh, listed the courses he had taken at both Duke and the University of Chicago, and within a year, he had received his bachelor and master's degree, and then in 1954, became the first PhD from our department. Um, I spent a lot of time with our uh, undergraduate honor society called Sigma Pi Sigma, and there he is in the second class ever introduced, introduced into Sigma Pi Sigma. Uh, at the time, listed himself as research technician. So that was probably right before they actually let him in as a student, um, and he was doing work in the labs already. Um, he did a postdoc at MIT uh, and started a career in industrial physics, and he worked at Olympic Radio and Television in New York, moved to California, and was vice president at Salt State Radiation, and then president of Contrad. And then a really big turning point happened, and I have a little picture for that. Is he got this patent. Okay. Uh, and this patent was a, a key element for uh, digital to audio conversion, useful for things like television reception and, and critical for compact disc. And he started a company, uh, Burke Tree Corporation, to exploit this, and he was very successful. And then he went on to do something else, which we find amusing. So one of my colleagues gave a lecture and mentioned that we as physicists are always amazed when one of us is any good at anything other than physics. <laughs> and no doubt, he went through in spades on this because he then founded something called Greenheart Farms, okay, which developed methods for vegetable transplants. So a good fraction of the vegetables that are grown in California, which mean a good fraction of the vegetables you eat, come from seedlings that came from Greenheart Farms, which I think is really amazing. Um, and so anyway, this year, we're going to hear a little an introduction for Professor Weiss in just a minute. I would like to acknowledge a few people who worked really hard to make this event happen. First and foremost is Carrie uh, Chah Chahosky. Her name is always tough for me to pronounce. Um, who works in our office and sent out all your invitations and organized basically everything. It's an amazingly difficult thing to do. Um, I would like to thank Phil Mannheim for the invitation and hosting the speaker. Um, and the University Events for helping us put this on. Um, Miraj Gemeyer is going around taking your photograph. Please wave and look happy when he comes by. Um, and of course, then we have David Katzenstein here, who is the son of Henry Katzenstein, is also really special for us. So thanks for being here. Nope. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Raina Weiss to give the 22nd Katzenstein Distinguished Lecture. Um, I've known him for a short while, but I feel like I've known him a much longer than that because he's such a, a personable person and such a pleasure to talk with on everything, especially to talk with on physics. Um, 
Professor Weiss received his bachelor's degree from MIT in 1955 and his PhD from MIT in 1962. He then did research at Tufts at Princeton and joined the MIT faculty in 1964, where he remained until he became emeritus in 2001. Uh, along with Kip Thorne, the late Ronald Drever, and Barry Barish, spearheaded the development of LIGO, the Laser Interferometry Wave Observatory, which he's going to talk about uh, in his presentation today. Um, one of the, it's just two, two uh, obser observatories, one in Washington State and one in Louisiana, and at Louisiana State, Professor Weiss has served as an adjunct professor of physics. Um, as well as uh, being interested in, in gravity waves, he's, he's interested in atomic clocks and in the cosmic microwave background. And many of you may remember we had a visit about 10 years ago from John Mather, uh, who was involved in COVID. And this is one of the programs that uh, Professor Weiss has also been very uh, active in. In fact, he received an award uh, with John Mather and the Kobe team, he received the Gruber Prize in Cosmology in 2006, and with Ronald Dreamer, received the Einstein Prize in 2007. For his achievement of gravitational wave detection in 2016 and 2017, he received the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, the Shaw Prize, the Kavli Prize in Astrophysics, the Harvey Prize, which he received together with Kip Thorne and Ronald Trevor, the Smithsonian Magazine's American Ingenuity Award in the Physical Sciences category, which he received along with Kip Thorne and Barry Barish. He received the Willis E. Lamb Award for Laser Science and Quantum Optics, and the Princess of Asturias Award, which he received jointly with Kip Thorne and Barry Barish. Um, he received numerous other awards, but of course, the he's most well known for is in, 19, in 2017, along with Kip Thorne and Barry Barish, uh, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics. Now, to put, his work, to put his work into some kind of context, in 1905, Einstein developed the special theory of relativity, which many of you will have heard of and will know that it's produced perhaps the most famous ever equation of physics, E equals mc squared which says that from a mass M, you can produce an energy if you multiply it by an enormous number, the square of the speed of light. And this has led to many developments over, over the years. However, in 1905, Einstein was faced with a real problem, and that was that Newton's law of gravity didn't obey Einstein's special relativity. And so he had to do something about it. He spent Ten years. He worked on this for ten years, and in, 20, in 1915, he produced general relativity, the theory which is the theory of gravity. At that time, a prediction was made, a very strange prediction, that there would be gravity waves. This was a hundred years ago. Well, Einstein's work has been with us ever since, and then, in 2015, the hundred the yeah, anniversary of, um, of Einstein's developing general relativity, the physics community decided that nationally they were going to have events to celebrate this 100th year. We had a whole series of lectures here at the university, and one of the speakers um, graciously agreed to come was Professor Weiss. And it turns out that in that same year, 100 years after Einstein's work, gravity waves were discovered, and Professor Weiss came here, and he had one in his pocket, and, and he never said a word, because they weren't ready to go cover So I think he may one day qualify as a spy, <laughs> but they're keeping things quiet. But today, he's going to tell us, now that things are public, he's going to tell us about this work on the discovery of gravity waves. So please welcome Professor Rainer Weiss. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you really hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, all right. I just want to make sure. And Walter, can you hear me? Wow, I'm, I made it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Bill. I mean, that, that's very sweet of you. And I, all those awards are somewhat embarrassing. Right? Uh, but I had a very good day. And, uh, and I learned a lot from the astronomers who are here. They're all new, new, new to this place. And it's delightful to have talked to them. It's, in fact, this is a delightful place, I have to tell you that. I thought, everybody I've talked to has been friendly, willing to tell me what they're doing, and willing to listen to my nonsense. I mean, just like, <laughs> Anyway, what am I really here supposed to do is, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Katzenstein, can you, and you may want to talk into this, because I'm going to ask you a question. And that is, what does the sour mean in his middle name? That is uh, my grandmother. Rosa Sauer was her maiden name, uh -huh. and the uh, name was passed along. And actually, this was all in Louisiana. Really, in Louisiana? Yeah. Where? Freeport. Sure, well, Freeport. I live in a big Jewish community. <laughs> <laughs> not where I go, but living since Louisiana is not a Jew in Louisiana. <laughs> okay. Anyway, wow. So now we know. I saw that. I couldn't help but notice <laughs> having a name like that. Had, 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 had that is. Anyway. So uh, I'm going to do a little more on what Bill started with. And, and I look, this lecture may last a little longer, and I'll keep looking at you. Then, right? I will look at you and even ask you at a critical moment if you will let me go on. But I'm not going to talk for two hours. That's crazy. But I might talk for two, one hour and ten minutes. That might be longer than many of you would like. Uh, look, I, the, uh, the big thing is that uh, what Bill told you is absolutely true. Let me start with this. Uh, so all this works. That's Isaac Newton, and below that is an equation which works extremely well. And despite Einstein's worries in 1905 that Phil told you about, that worked so well that it got us to the moon. It works so well that it gets us to virtually everything we're doing in astronomy, most of what we do in astronomy, but it fails in a couple of places, as Phil pointed out. As many of you know, let me just so well, those of you who are just starting in high school. This is a relationship in which gravity, which is the force of gravity, is related to a constant which we're not worried about. But the important thing about this relationship is that two people sitting next to each other, one has a mass m1, another one who has a mass m2, attract each other a little bit. I mean, I'm not talking emotionally, I'm talking <laughs> And uh, they attract each other, and, they, and the force between them gets smaller as the square of the distance. And that gets everything that you want to do. In fact, even the things we discovered later, when we get to deep into very strong gravity, you can go a long way with just that. But there are places where it fails, and you've got to know where it fails. One place it fails is on your little receiver that you carry around now. Everybody has their little GPS device in their pockets. I think that tells you how to get home. And if people didn't correct for something I'm going to tell you about in a minute, the fact that clocks get affected by gravity, you wouldn't get home. You would get to the, some, not the town next to you, but probably a couple of blocks away from where you want to go. In other words, that's very important to make GPS work, and I'll get to that in a second. The other thing it doesn't work for is when you talk about large velocities. That when things are moving at high velocities, and that's really the big problem that Einstein saw in 1905. And then lastly, it doesn't work for a thing which was very dear to all of us. Namely, that the information, and this whether it's gravitational information or like magnetic information, information cannot go any faster than the velocity of light. And so, for example, if the sun suddenly disappeared, somebody magically took the sun away. I mean, this is impossible to do, what I'm about to describe, but you can think about it. And, uh, you, and you were sitting on the earth here, you wouldn't know about the sun disappearing for about eight, nine minutes. Because the light takes about that long to get to you, from the sun. It also turns out, and this is something Newton's theory doesn't have in it, if you took the sun away, and remember we're going around, let's say, it's loosely speaking, a circle around the sun, and somebody took the sun away, you wouldn't know that the Earth was now supposed to no longer be attracted to the sun. It would continue going around a circle until eight minutes later, and then it would go off on a tangent. And that, that, is the beginning of what might be called gravitational wave. Now, let me say something which I don't mean to criticize you, Phil, but most of the experts in my place say gravity waves are for water. 
gravitational waves are the ones that do this. See, I mean, gravity waves are the things you see when you when you drop a rock into the water. I'll t I'll have to come to that later. But so I have to call it gravitational waves around my books. Okay. So anyway, here then is what replaced this, and this picture is sort of an anachronism. That's Einstein very much later in his life than in 1915. But let me, I can't explain that equation to you, but I want to tell you what the equation says. That's the, requ that's the replacement for the equation that was the Newton force equation. First of all, forces are gone. We don't talk about forces anymore. We talk about something else. And what is it? Well, this side of the equation, this thing is the geometry of space and time. How you measure space and how you measure time. And this, well, that's just a number, but this is the distribution of energy and therefore matter and energy in that space. So in other words, what that equation tells you, and it's, this is a very simple version. If you try to make that equation do something real, it turns into pages and pages of algebra. This is just a very short encapsulation of this, but you can talk about it. What that equation is telling you is that matter distorts space and distorts time. And makes that makes the space no longer Euclidean. And well, I'll try to show you this in this picture here. This is one way of doing. How many of you know what a jungle gym is? Yeah, everybody. Hey, great. Everybody. Well, most New Yorkers know what a jungle gym is. And a jungle gym is it's just parallel bars in all all directions. X, Y, Z. You have bars, and they intersect at places. Think of a jungle gym, but now you have to do something special. Cut the jungle gym in the middle. And make it two, just look at the two dimensions of the jungle gym that's left. That's right in front of you. They've thrown the top away, they've thrown the bottom away, just a sheet of the jungle gym across. That two dimensional thing is what you're looking at here. So, what you're seeing, for example, is these are the bars, and you can see that the bars are there's the bars going up and down, but they're not in this picture. It's just all in two dimensions right now. And what has been done, <clears throat> you've taken the sun and plunked it into that system right above the jungle gym. And it has distorted space in here. Space that was straight lines now are curved lines. Don't think of it as a third dimension. They are fundamentally curved, still in two dimensions. That's a little sneaky, I know. But think of it that way. And then uh, here is the here's the earth, and it's made its little change in its curvature too. And now there's something missing in this picture, which is very important. What's missing is clocks. And what happens, I didn't want to draw them all in. But there are clocks all along here, every intersection. It's an expensive thing to do. You put clocks everywhere where the two bars come together, or three bars have come together. And you make those clocks all read the same moment in time at the same instant in time. It reads the same number at the same instant in time. That's not something you can prove very easily. You can't just take a picture of this on a, and on a film see that, because it takes different lengths of time for light from here to get you and light that's from there to get you. The clocks will read different times. You've got to go around with a little clock in your pocket. Oh yeah, this one reads that, make sure. Like a light keeper in, a, in a London. You've got to check each light. You've got to check each clock. That's the way you have to think of this time being the same everywhere. And then what happens is that in the region, and this is the part of the part that makes distortions of time, in this region in here, and we'll see this in spades when we get to the discovery that was made, uh, that the clocks in here run a little more slowly than they run over here. In other words, part of the theory, Einstein's theory, is not just distortions in space, it's distortions in time. And the distortions in time are such that in weak gravitational fields, or very vanishing gravitational fields, clocks run faster than in strong gravitational fields. And that was a very famous thing that was many neat people tried to find over the years. It was finally done with the Musbar effect on the Earth. That was, uh, I won't go into that, obviously you can ask me questions about it. It has been proved other ways. You want the lights on? I'm happy to have Can you still see this thing? Not as well. Not as well. Okay. All right, let me go on to the next slide. I want to now talk to you about the gravity. <laughs> <laughs> now, all the lights are on. That doesn't work either. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, that's a, that's a slide that allows you to see this. Hey, if you make it some progress. Hey, no. <laughs> right. okay. So now, here is what I can tell you about gravitational waves. I'm trying to give you a picture so that you can imagine 
how the gravitational waves are detected. I'm not going to go deeper than that. But there's a very simple picture that you can draw. And that, first of all, let me tell you a little about them. Uh, Einstein wrote about them in 1916. He had the theory that made the first equation in 1915. He makes some nice mistakes in that paper, and he corrects them in 1918. Now, if you're interested in the history of science, it's worth looking at that paper. And those of you who can read German can see right away, but you can now get all the Einstein papers in English. They're on the web. So it's really wonderful. And you can see the mistake he made. I won't tell you much more about it, but it's a sort of interesting piece of history of science. And what he, in this first paper already, he had, he didn't have the sources quite right, but he had the kinematics, which I'm about to describe, absolutely right. So the sources turn out to be better described than the 1918 paper. And they are non-spherically symmetric accelerations. In other words, things that are accelerating make gravitational waves. But a thing that is like a balloon that expands uniformly and contracts uniformly does not make gravitational waves. And that's all very much like an electricity magnetism. You can always look at a spherical source as though it was at a point in the middle of the source. So it's the same kind of cancellations take place in that tensor field, just for those who want to know the reason. And so it turns out that now you have accelerating matter, mass, makes gravitational waves. And the, what is the kinematics of the waves? Einstein assumed they probably get at the speed of light, and he had very good reason for this. You will find out in this lecture that we now know that to a part in 10 to the 15. Gravitational waves travel at the same speed as electromagnetic waves. It's really quite a development, I have to say. And it has killed off a lot of crazy theories of gravity. Like it. Just that fact alone. Uh, but it was a guess back in 1918 and 16. The other one is that transverse waves. And here, Phil, is the reason why I made it possible. See, transverse waves are, are, are waves like water waves. In other words, they do their stuff. Is a water. They, they're waves in which they propagate, let's say, in this direction or toward you, and they do their thing perpendicular to the right direction in which they move. In other words, that's a wave that travels in this direction, but perpendicular to that direction, it does all the things that are interesting. Okay? And water waves are like that. Just look at what water waves do. They travel in that direction. You can see the heights and the different heights of the water all being perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is moving. Electromagnetic waves do that. Sound waves don't do that. They, they do their dirty work along the direction in which they move. Okay. So, that's an important thing. Okay, so this is, and they are strains in space, and I'm going to show you that. So let's see this picture. I'm going to make that picture move now. And there's a red dot. I hope you can see that red dot. That's you. Okay. You're standing at that red dot. And, and the thing is now going to get turned on, and the gravitational wave is coming out at you, or going into the picture. I don't care. But it's moving perpendicular to the picture. Let me start it. And I hope it all runs a little. Yeah, so, okay. So now you'll notice some interesting things about that motion. Just look at it for a while. Don't get too dizzy. Yet. And uh, what happens is that here, here you are. And what happens is you'll notice that at any one moment, one direction, let's call this the east-west direction, is expanding at the same time as the north-south direction is contracting. And a little bit later, that reverses. I hope you see that, right? It's a stretching in space in one direction and contraction in the other. That's one property of the wave, and that's strongly exploited when you try to detect these things. The other thing that's going on is a little more subtle, is that if you look at two, the two dots next to you, like that one and that one, they're not moving a lot relative to each other, this guy relative to that guy. But they're moving a lot between that dot and that dot. And in fact, the amount of motion that they have is proportional to their separation. So okay, there's a constant at any one moment in that picture in any one direction. It's the change in position, or the change of the separation, divided by their separation. That constant, delta L divided by L, is a fixed, is, a, is the field quantity for this kind of thing. It's called the strain. And engineers know all about that. Most physicists don't know much about strains, but engineers know about strain. Okay? And uh, so you have, and let me say, repeat the thing, you have a strain in one direction, that's positive, a strain in the other direction, that's negative. And uh, that's it. That's the wave, and it prob propagates at the velocity of light. That's all you really need to know to understand how you might detect these things, and also how you might improve the detection. So let me go on. Okay. The two people who first saw the evidence, or, and uh, there's a third person named Weisberg, who was a, a junior member of this later on, were Hulse, who was a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts in the, in the 70s, and, or yeah, late, late middle 70s, 
and, and Joe Taylor, who was also at that time a professor, a radio astronomy professor at the University of Massachusetts. And they found an unbelievable system. This system turns out to have been a test laboratory for Einstein's theory. And let me quickly tell you what the system is. <coughs> Pulse went to Arecibo and he turned, uh, they, 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 they listened to the, to the radio, they listened, actually they listened to the radio signals coming in and they heard a thing going like that. I can't quite go fast enough. 17 times a second. That's a pulsar, they had been known before. But this was a very special pulsar. They noticed, pulsar noticed that he was wise enough to follow it, that some, about every four hours, it changed a little bit its rate. In other words, in one four hour period, it was going a little faster than 17 times a second. And a little bit, four hours later, it was going a little slower than 17 times. <coughs> and they made a model of this, which consists of this thing that you see here. Here's a pulsar, which is this neutron star device that has this rotation that is at least 17 times a second. And what it's doing, and there's another one, they didn't see another star. There was nothing to be seen there, and there was nothing to hear from this guy. He was most likely another pulsar. But at least he was a neutron star, because otherwise they couldn't have been that close to each other. And what happened is that the model they made is that these two guys were going around each other in an orbit. And that's, in fact, if you think of the antenna here, imagine the great big dish, our pseudo dish. While they're in this part of the orbit, they're going a little faster. This guy, when he's on here, heading toward you, it's going a little faster. When they're heading away, it's going a little slower. It's the same kind of effect you have when a top is chasing you on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the car in front of you that's speeding. It's not you. It's the guy, when you hear him come at you, it's, it's a little higher pitch, and then thank God he goes by you, it's lower pitch. <laughs> right. So what is the big discovery these guys made? The discovery they made was uh, this picture, which is a little elaborate. Yeah, you're going to have to get used to some elaborate pictures, but this is epic, and uh, it's the x-axis is time, and here's 1973, and there's 2000 right here. And this is, that these numbers start here with zero, and they get more and more negative. And this is a plot of the time it takes for one orbit to go around once. Every time that they go around each other, you see this from a speeding up and a slowing down of the, of, the, of the thing you hear. And you can track that very carefully. And what they plotted points over these epics. And these points are the points they put in here all along this thing. And it was getting faster and faster. But the time it took for one orbit gets less shorter and shorter. Okay. Now, that, when you have a system that's orbiting in gravity, that means it's losing energy. It sounds persnickety, I know. Kinetic energy sounds like it's going up, but it turns out there's something called potential energy which is going the other way. And so it turns out that things that speed up, as they, and you know, every Earth satellite does that. You know, when you launch them, they go up, and now they get, as they come down in, in Earth, or they come down in the atmosphere, before they hit the atmosphere, they're going pretty fast. They're going faster than when they are in orbit. So at any rate, what that is, that this, these dots were the measurements they made, and the line that goes through it is, in fact, what you do is you solve that Einstein equation. For these two masses that you now know and know all about, you get, in fact, if you include gravitational waves, you have to do that, you have to include gravitational waves, which Einstein's equations automatically do anyway, you get something that's a, almost a perfect fit to that these things are losing energy to gravitational waves. That was the very first piece of hard evidence man had that gravitational waves exist and that they do what they, Einstein thought they would do. So that was 1911. You can see what all this happened. <coughs> all right, so that was something which was a big, I think that was the discovery of gravitational waves. It wasn't what we did. And the very first person to try to, uh, to try to do this was a guy who, sort of an interesting story in physics. And so the fellow you're seeing here is Joe Weber, who was a professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, and, uh, and what happened there was that he was at a 1957 meeting called the Chapel Hill meeting of people discussing gravity. This is Einstein had just died in 1955. And one of the big topics was how would you ever show the reality of gravitational waves? Because Einstein had changed his mind many times. And so uh, uh, Joe Weber and John Wheeler, who was a very famous guy who did relativity, did nuclear physics before that, came up with the idea of making a thing that looks like this. Here is uh, here's Joe with the thing that they made. It's a great big aluminum bar. You can see it's quite big. There's Joe, he's a standard looking man. 
And this is quite sort of uh, as big as Joe is in length. And that's a huge piece of aluminum. And he's mounting strain gauges on it. That's what those things are. He's gluing them to the surface. And what he's hoping for is that a gravitational wave will come along, go through the bar, and do the trick I showed you with those dots. Stretch the bar, and then in one dimension, and contract it in the other. And it will go through it, and it's the same as though the bar had been hit by a hammer. And like a xylophone bar. Now, to his misfortune, and this is really his misfortune, is that he made three of these. He had, at the end of it, in, in 1969, he published a paper that is based on having one of those bars in Chicago at the Argonne Lab. I know people here who have a connection to Argonne. Uh, and then uh, there was one in his office, or near his office, in University of Maryland, and another one eight miles away in a golf course, not too far from Watch Park. And he saw typically three events per day, which as far as he thought, they were coincident in all three of the bars. And he then published a paper in, in 1969 saying that he had discovered the direct, made a direct detection of gravitational waves. Now, thank God in physics, and this is not such a horribly hard experiment. I mean, you can imagine doing this experiment. A lot of people read this paper. They weren't doubting him, but they, when you make a major discovery like that, which is, it was a major discovery, everybody in the world who is interested in it can make his own experiment over again and check. And to his misfortune, nobody, there were people in the United States, several groups in the United States, several groups in Europe, a group in Japan, nobody saw what he saw. And that was a big misfortune. I won't go into any of that. I don't know exactly what he saw. I have a theory about it. I don't want to do it publicly. You can ask me questions later about it. I have, it was never proved. And nobody, none of us really know what he was seeing. But I guarantee you he was not seeing gravitational waves. Because at best that he could have had, the strain sensitivity now means something to you in a minute. He was a factor of a million to 10 million away from having enough sensitivity to see anything that we now know are gravitational waves. He was seeing something completely different. Okay. So now, and that was 1960, oh boy, this computer went Oh boy. Yeah. I am sorry about that, I'm going to have to reboot. That's not good. I'm sorry, this is going to take about a minute. <laughs> such a way, this particular apparatus, that if a gravitational wave comes down on it, that, remember, and then, by the way, this is the place where the red square was that I showed you when I showed you the picture of the gravitational wave. And what happened is that, so this is where you were standing, and this is one, that mirror is an equal time away from this beam splitter as this mirror is. In other words, these two distances are identical in time. And then what will happen is you'll see, when you see some light, at the photo So let's see it after. So here comes the laser putting out light, and the wiggly thing in the middle is the electric field that's associated with the light. 
And uh, here it's reflecting, and uh, it's also happening in this arm. Wherever there's red, there is a red light power. And there's no light power here because the two waves, if these two paths are identical, they cancel each other in a fermentation. Now comes the gravitational wave down on this thing, which stretches one arm and shrinks the other. And you see that light does get to the detector that when you spoil that equality in time. Okay? That is no more than the basic idea behind it. If you understand that, you understand how the detection takes place. Okay? Now, there are many interpretations of what you mean by stretching <coughs> space, and let's leave those for questions. Because Einstein himself got himself into trouble with that. There are three ways to think about this, and I don't want to do it now. Just for the moment, whatever method you like, think about it. Okay? So gravitational waves have detected that. Now here comes the kicker. And uh, what you see here is a picture of uh, Kip Thorne when he was probably in his middle 40s, 45. Looks very different than that now, as I do then. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the thing is that he made a prediction in, uh, in a book called Gravitation, among other places, but he also did it something later on called 2,000 years, uh, 200 years, 300 years of gravitation. Which says, look, if you're going to succeed with this, and here's some formula, unfortunately, that's H. This is the actual quantity that's called the strain. That's what I call the strain. And we can give it a symbol, H. And if you want to get into this business of making a detection of gravitational wave, you've got to get to a point where you are able to measure strains of 10 to the minus 21. How did he come up with that? He came up with that because he understood general relativity. But he also knew a good bit about astrophysics. He knew what kind of things were out there and the masses and where, how far the things were. And he, it turns out, he was remarkably right, as you'll see in about five minutes or 10 minutes. He was right on the money. But that meant something quite serious for the people doing the experiment. In other words, when you make a four kilometer system like what was done later in LIGO, and you want to know what's the delta L you have to measure, the text, that strain of 10 to minus 21, you take four kilometers and multiply it by this number, and you wind up with four times 10 to minus 18 meters. And that is a tiny number. And most engineers, when they see that, they look at you like you're somewhere between having too many smokes of pot. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing is, uh, what is it? It's about 1,000 the size of a nuclear. That's what it is. And that is, well, let's put it in the context of what was the challenge that this threw to the experimenters. And not just me, by any means. And they have, well, the two challenges. One challenge is that if you want to do this, 10 to minus 18, you have to measure the position of something to well, wavelength of light is 10 to minus 6 meters. You have to measure something to 10 to minus 12 of a wavelength of light to get in the business. Millions times a million. That turns out to be not so impossible. The part that really is hard is this one. You have to make sure that the mirrors that you have out there don't shape with the Earth and shape with all sorts of forces that are much, much bigger than what might be interpreted the force of a gravitational wave. In other words, you're shaking here in this room by 10 to the minus 6 meters. And you're probably close enough to the ocean, so it's more like 2 or 3 times 10 to the minus 6. And you can, so it turns out that is sort of another factor of 10 to the minus 12 of the motion of the Earth that you have to solve. And so here's, I just want to quickly show you one, I'm not showing you all the tricks, I can't do that. Because uh, you'll get bored with me very quickly. But the thing is that I want to show you at least some of the things you do to get that first factor of 10 to the world, for light. And here is now what you already know a little about. Here's the laser. There's that beam spinner you saw in that little animation. And there's that distant mirror. And there's that distant mirror. Those all allegedly are familiar to you now. And you saw them a few minutes ago. On the other hand, there's some new things in here. These, this mirror right there, which is a partial mirror, and that same thing over here, which is a partial mirror. And this thing is called a fabry pro cavity. Don't worry about that. What it effectively does, it takes the light that comes in and bounces it something like 300 times in that cavity, and it bounces 300 times in this cavity, and you make sure those times are about the same. They have to be very close to the same, in fact, because you'd like to have zero time difference between those paths. So that's part of the trick you have to do. And now when there's no light going to the photo detector, which is a situation that was in that movie you saw, no light goes here, where does the light go? Well, the light that's coming out of the laser is coming back to you. Most lasers, and you know that better than anybody else in this room, you can't do that to a laser. 
You can't put light back into a laser and expect it to still function. In fact, you use that. And what you do is you put another partial mirror right here. And let's quickly see what that mirror does. It does the following. One, the light beam that comes out of the laser, and it gets this, and then part of it gets reflected. I can show you that, but you imagine it. At the same time, when there's no light going to the photodetector, all the light that went through this mirror comes back. If there's no absorption in these mirrors, all of it comes back and comes through this mirror back to the laser. But you now have two beams going in this direction back to the laser. And if you make the transmission of this mirror just right, you can make it so they interfere with your big chances. Just like they cancel at the detector. So you have a very interesting situation. You might have, let's say, uh, 10 watts coming out of this laser. And in this cavity of the, in here, you might have maybe a kilowatt. And in here, you might have something like uh, 0.1 megawatts of light. So you have, by these tricks, you have slowly gotten to the point where you have enough photons, effectively, that are going to be modulated by the gravitational wave so that you can get that factor of technical as well. There are other tricks, but this is a dominant trick. So this is the kind of thing you do to make it so that you can get around the, the problems with light. Let me show you quickly some of the noises that are associated with this. Now, for those of you who, uh, this is a little more technical and don't get upset if you don't follow everything I'm about to say. Uh, I'll get back to things that are probably a little easier, but this is frequency of gravitational waves. And this is the strain, but as a spectrum. So for example, if the 10 to the minus 21, or, well, let's see where we would be. This is the, by the way, this is the envelope of the noises that you are fighting to make these measurements. And at 100 hertz, which is about the most sensitive place in these detectors, this is the very first detector we built in that big facility, you wind up with a number around 10 to the minus 23 per group hertz. You look at the hertz, it's about 10 to the minus 22 RMS. So factor 10 better than what did one, okay? But here are the things that limit it. And here, this piece right there, that's called shock noise here, and here becomes radiation pressure noise. This is quantum noise in that system. In other words, the quantum theory of light, and there are many ways of thinking about that, limit your ability to do this. And they limit your ability just the way when you learn quantum theory, or when you teach quantum theory. There's a place where you, you try to get more position information, you need more light, and you do that by having more laser power, and that brings this down. On the other hand, if you have more laser power, this radiation pressure fluctuation that actually pushes on the mirror gets worse. So it turns out that in this initial detector, this wasn't a big problem. In the current detector, it's become a big problem, and quantum noise, the fact that light, when you try to make a measurement of these mirrors, actually pushes the mirror around in a random way is very, very important. So that's a basic noise. The other basic noise in this picture is thermal noise, the fact that you're dealing with room temperature stuff and everything shapes at room temperature, so there's a little bit of a budget here. And lastly, you're dealing here with an incomplete cancellation of seismic noise. And that, well, that's just the fact that you can't completely get rid of the up and down motion of the Earth. You do very well. And I'll get to that, how you do that in a second. The thing I want to point out, and one of the reasons I put this picture in and making you agonize with it, is this noise right there. It's called gravity gradient noise. Let me describe it to you, and it's the reason why there is a future at low frequencies in this field, if you're interested, only in space. You can't do this on the ground. And what this is, is the following. You have a, let's say the ground, when it shakes, and makes accelerations on the ground, that you can get rid of by making a device that measures your motion with respect to the fixed star. That's called a seismometer. There are many devices that can do that. Even a telescope will do that. On the other hand, what happens you can't do anything about is the fact that those accelerations of the ground are accompanied by density changes in the ground. Okay? And those density changes, both in the ground and in the atmosphere, the density changes, they tug on the mirrors. They pull on by the plain old Newton, F equals m1 times m2 divided by d squared. It's just exactly that. They, they screw up. And you can't, and look at this, look how, how serious it gets. This is 10 hertz, and by the time 1 hertz, it's really going to wipe you out. So it turns out we don't think we can do measurements on the ground at frequencies much below something like 5 cycles per second. It's just not an easy way to do that. There's some things you can think about, but that's the reason why you will hear at the end of the lecture that people want to do this in space. Okay. That's why I had to show you that slide. Okay, now I'll tell you a little about the detection and how it was done. 
There are two detectives in the United States. There's one in, in Washington State, another one in Louisiana. There is a detector in Pisa, Italy, or near Pisa, and that has become active now, and it's a very important instrument. There's a research detector in, in Germany, in Hanover. It's about 600 years long. And then there are planned detectors in the Kagura, in Ka, uh, the Kagura is called, in the Kamioka mine, that is in Japan, where the neutrino detector is. And they've dug a big tunnel, and they're building a detector that's three kilometers inside the mountain. That's an interesting thing they're doing. They're trying to get around that gravity gradient noise as best as they can. And they'll make a little improvement. And then there's another, and that will be ready, we hope, in about 2020. And this is a detector which is built in India using a detector that was also built by LIGO. I won't go into the history of that, but they hope to be on the air by 2025. And I will show you in the, sort of the end of the talk why it's so important to have many detectors that are anticipated here. You, in order to tie yourself to what the astronomers do, and we want to do ultimately, and it became very important, as you'll see in a few minutes, when you start looking with many different channels at the universe, you not only look with gravitational waves and optical and infrared and, and neutrinos, everything, all of those things become much more useful if we can tell in a gravitational, gravitational signal where on the sky the signal comes from. That's very important. And we can't do that with two detectors, as you'll see in a minute. You can only, because there's no way to point a gravitational wave detector. You can only you have to measure time differences, and you'll see this now when we get to what it detects. In the, in the, in the, in the so let me give you a quick travel log of LIGO. This won't take long. This is the Louisiana site looking above. And here is the site in, at, at Hanford, Washington. And here is the beam tube. This is a concrete enclosure around the beam tube. And this is the same enclosure down in Louisiana. And here is the beam tube itself. That's a very, very high vacuum. And the laser beams operate in there. This is a laser table like in her lab. And uh, that's a standard kind of thing. And here is the control room in Louisiana. And people learning how to operate the instrument. And that's a whole art. You have to learn how to do a lot of servo locking and a whole bunch of stuff. So that's as much as I show you. I do want to show you this picture because it's important for the historical purpose. What it is, is this, and it's a little bit, if you have ambitions, you might learn something from it, in terms of doing something very expensive, which we have probably too much ambition to. <laughs> but what it is, is this. This is a history, I know, very much like the picture I showed you of the noise. Frequency this way, it don't matter what this is, it's in this case, position wise. And this is the evolution of the instrument, the initial detector. And look at how many orders of magnitude it took over eight years. We started up here, and it was pretty crappy. And we wound up down here, and in there there's a dotted line, this line right there, which is a design sensitivity for that detector. It's buried in this, and it didn't quite make it at low frequencies. That's 100 hertz. And what we did is we had no detections of anything. And I'm very proud of that. And why? Because it's not fooling around. I mean, you knew exactly what was going on in that instrument. And you could tell there were no gravitational waves. You, what you, want, uh, you weren't leaving it to a reader of a picture to decide whether you saw a gravitational wave. We made the assertion that we saw nothing. And because we made design sensitivity, we were able to go on and make another version of this called the Jan Slider. And that's the thing that made it. So there was a two-stage process. And what was the big things that were changed in that? One of the things I won't go to all of it was a much better ground noise isolation. And uh, what this is, for example, here, this is attached to the ground, and here's one pendulum, and another pendulum hanging from that, and another pendulum hanging from that, and here's this very precious mirror that's not supposed to move very much. And so, I don't know if you, if you ever, I mean, there's one invention that is useful to you guys. That isn't very useful, that's sort of a very delicate little thing. But what is the basis of it? If you have, let's say, here's what you could do. If I took my pants off and I hang something, but, and, oh, well, not my pants off, but my belt pants off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, well, what happens is that, that you would notice the following. If you hang, you can do this at home. It's not hard. Hang a, hang a cup from a piece of, a piece of uh, string, and you'll notice the following. If you, this is the earth right here. And if you move very slowly, they move together. It's like that. But if this moves fast, this doesn't move at all. And that's just F equals MA. That, that's just basic. Physics. And that's, the, that's what the idea of that isolation is. You've got each stage, four stages of isolation. The very tricky thing is up here. And I won't describe it except to tell you that's something you could use if you're running a lab. Especially if you're running a lab that's trying to fight the ground noise. 
What it is is a very same idea as the thing that when you go on an airplane and you put headphones on that peel the noise of the airplane. How many of you have done that? Most of you have done that. These are the Bose headphones, but they are the same idea. You measure the noise in the airplane with a little microphone, and that gets transmitted into the earphone, which is also passing the noise through its bad coupling to your ear. And you invert the signal of the earphone so that it and the noise that gets through the headphones cancel each other interferometrically. And that kills the sound of the airplane. It's the same thing. Here what's done, you use seismometers. And this is why I think it's useful to other people. You use seismometers, there they are, on a platform. And then you push the platform around so that no noise, that the <coughs> seismometer doesn't read any noise anymore. In effect, you've canceled the motion of the Earth. And that platform, you have to do, do it again, you do it twice. And effectively, you've done an active vibration system, vibration isolation system. And that's very useful for people doing microscopic things if they're in a noisy environment. I, I highly recommend it to you, instead of fighting and taking your lab and taking it out into the woods someplace where there's no noise, you can do it right in this room, okay? Or in a new building you're about to get. Okay, so here's what we saw with this new building. This is the first detection we made, and the one that I knew about when I came here and talked, but I couldn't tell about for a couple of reasons, not because of secrecy. But that's part of it, obviously. The other reason I couldn't talk about it, we weren't sure of it. I mean, the, the discovery was uh, in September 2015. We had got this thing, which is sort of amazing. It's huge. And what you see here in these pictures, this is time. And this is strange. And look at this. This is 10 to the minus 21 is the scale. And here is 1 times 10 to the minus 21. And this is junk. A little out of the junk. This is a living, this is in Louisiana. A signal begins to develop out of that. And there it gets quite big. And then this is junk again. And then it becomes nothing. This is the same thing seen at Hanford, but not exactly at the same time. <coughs> Let me show you how, what you have, it, it, the signal, this signal was seven milliseconds, seven thousandth of a second ahead of that one. And that was the time it took for the signal to go from Louisiana through the earth to find itself in, in, in Washington State. That's the first indication we had that these waves, if they were truly gravitational waves, traveled close to the velocity of light. That was the first indication we had. So then you do little tricks like this, and you superpose them, sliding the data, and you can see this is junk, they don't look like you're saying, but there's noise in them, there's no denying it, but there something evolves in both of them that looks pretty much the same, but it's not identical. It can't be identical because there's noise in the system. And that thing was then interpreted. And uh, here's another way to interpret it, which is sort of a nice way because we need this when we get to the next discovery. What this is, is the same data but expressed in such a way that you hear it. And you look, what are the frequency components in that signal? So here's time again. And here are the signals that we were plotting before as time series. But this is now something in frequency. It's plotted over here. This is the bottom of the piano, right about there, sort of 20 hertz. Here's middle C at 256. And here is a thing that is a sort of sonogram of, of this thing expressed as a sound. It, and where it's brightest is where it's strongest. And that's a, these are the same pictures that both at Hanford and in Livingston, uh, Washington State and, and Louisiana. So now let me play it. You don't hear much. You get that little whoop at the end. Well, you can trick your ear by doing it by fast speed. Okay. Let's play it a little faster. And what you're hearing is indeed the following. And that's the, I think, the really. There's another, besides the technology of building LIGO, which had its ups and downs and took a long time, this almost took just as long, right? what you're about to see. And I think it's just as miraculous. It's very hard to solve the Einstein equations. I mean, that little equation I showed you looked perceptibly simple, but it's a, it's a phony. It says symbolically what it is. You try to do something real with those equations, you're dealing with something that's really real. And, the, and so what now, what people recognize that many, many years ago, and they realize that the way you could do this is by doing numerical solutions. Use a computer to solve the Einstein equation. And what you're about to see is the actual output of a computer program that happened to be matching what this is. It turns out it's this, it's, and you'll see, it's two solar mass, 30 solar mass black holes. The signal that you were seeing is here. That's the tail end of it. We don't see it way out here. That's at lower frequencies. And here, what you notice, is uh, you'll see a, you'll see an output 
is the time. It changes every once in a while. And these are the two black holes. And you'll see as we get into this, there's a coding here. This is that same two-dimensional cut through the system. There's the strains. That's the little R bars. And what you'll do the color coding is how much the clocks have changed. When this gets very red or black, when it's black, the time has stopped. And watch what happens as these two black holes, because they're losing energy to gravitational waves, which are going off, as they get closer together. Uh, what will happen is that, first of all, the, 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 there gets a real storm in space. You'll see that these waves that are developed in the metric get bigger and bigger. Now it's slowed down. They're getting close enough so that they're about to collide, these two guys. And you can see there's time. Time has stopped pretty much right there in the, in the throat of the black hole. I mean, these are dramatic distortions of space and time. And now you've just formed a new black hole, and it becomes quiescent. And this is all, we didn't see this part. That's the part that we don't have, didn't have enough sensitivity for an off-coming gravitational wave. That thing is, uh, is, fits the data that we have as well as we can make it, that particular model. And it comes only for, and it, you can't do this entirely by aggregate methods. The end, at the end point, the two black holes are going sort of point, uh, let's say, point <coughs> three times the velocity of light. Something like that. Two 30 solar mass objects going at close to the velocity of light. It's sort of inconceivable. Okay? And that's what was. And by the way, this event, and before I did, this is cute. And that event took place one billion years away from us. 10 to 9, 10 to the 9 years away. So it was, it's very close to us. <laughs> Don't get fooled. Your universe is at least 10, 10 to the 10 years old. So it's very close. So what this was was sort of cute. We made the announcement after I was here. And I, we made it in February. And this is a thing I saw in the New York City subway. This is a thing. I'll read it to you. It, this is in the New York City subway. The picture was taken by my, by my nephew. He's a pretty good photographer. He says, scientists found gravitational waves in outer space. If only it were that easy to find an, uh, an apartment in New York City with a walk-in closet. <laughs> <laughs> now this is in the public mind about a week after the matter. I couldn't believe it. I'm going from Manhattan to Brooklyn, and I see this in the subway. I mean, about the same time there was this cartoon in New York, and that's one bird talking to the other guy. Was, what you, was that you I heard just now, or was it two black holes for us? It was every 12th in New York. And to me, this has always been a marvel. I and mean, here's something which is a pretty complicated scientific result. There was enough of it that the public understood that they could sort of become part of it. And I do a lot of talking to high schools and grade schools, and I always go around asking the kids, well, uh, name a scientist. And I always, I always hear myself. And when you say, Black holes, they all know what a black hole is. It's, it's awful, it's going to eat you. <laughs> and they get that from the comic books. So it's enough of it's there, so it isn't totally strange. Okay? So that's what it is, and that's what one. Uh, well, here's the, the, the remainder of that story. Uh, and uh, there is this is now all, we've seen many more of black hole pairs. This is again time in a picture like this. This is again strain. And the guy we've been talking about is this guy. And very shortly after that, and uh, this indication, this is on uh, 9th of September 14th, 2015. Here's one that was measured in October 12th, 2015. And here's one that was, this is the one that really uh, finally made me believe. And this is in September 26th of 15. That one finally made me feel that, okay, we could go public. And a lot of other people, and I won't go into all the history, but that was a terrible time. Bill, that was what we were going through hell trying to figure out how we were really sure of this. That was, and this is what made it happen, that we were able to have the courage to say that. And by the way, let me say one thing that's interesting in this thing. Over here are the parameters that were the best fits to these things, using all the solutions of Einstein's equation. But I want to point something out to you about the first one, which is sort of remarkable. Mass is 30 is 30, and the amount of mass that was lost to, uh, to radiation was about three solar masses. Okay, about 5% of the mass disappeared. And let me tell you a sort of interesting thing. This will give you a feel for why gravitational waves are so weak, and also why Einstein in his early 1916 paper said they'll never amount to anything that man will have anything to do with. And this, this number, this sort of gives you a very good example. Suppose you took this event, 
And when I made those moderately big signals for us, I put it at the position of the sun, one AU away. So you did that. And then you say, what's the strain here at the Earth? It's 10 to the minus 6. The 10 minus 6 is zilk. I mean, you're, let's say you're 2 meters big. Can you tell if you, your ear has been moved by 2 microns? No. You might hear it. But you wouldn't even know it. The thing goes through you. It, you wouldn't even, wouldn't even perceive it. But what went through you was unbelievable. It's this number. The power that went through you per unit area is 10 to the 25 watts per meter squared. What's the sun put out to give you a sunburn? It's 1,000 watts per meter squared. 10 to the 22 times more energy per second went through you from these gravitational waves. But they did peanuts. That tells you the whole story. Okay? So, I'm sorry, that's the truth. That's why it's absurd. All right, here's the next development. And uh, I'm now at about time when I should stop. Can I have 10 minutes more? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're welcome to leave if you have to go somewhere. I, don't, I wouldn't mind at all. That could take me 10 minutes to get to know. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, for okay. This is the next big development. Now it turns out Virgo came on. Virgo is a tech detector in Italy. And uh, that uh, was also on, finally on, and this is the black hole they saw. They saw the same. Here's a, the one seen by LIGO. And there's the one with Virgo with the same pictures as before. It wasn't very wonderful, but they had a real signal. It's, it's a four sigma signal, each a five sigma signal. And here's the important piece of information that came out of that. Here's a picture of the sky. And if you take LIGO alone, it would have an uncertainty in the sky, a big banana like that. That's about 1,000 square degrees. And you tell that to an astronomer and say, go find it, and they'll laugh you out of the room. Most astronomers will. And what happens is that now, by adding the time differences between the two sites and Virgo, you can narrow the thing down to about 30 square degrees right there in that little thing. And that's not quite so bad. And then the next thing I'm going to tell you, that became crucial. Okay? So that was the big reason for having Virgo. Here's the other thing that, that the big discovery that was made. And by the way, all of this happened in the same month. Virgo saw a black hole in, uh, in August of uh, 2017. And this event, which is, I think, well, I think the black holes are fantastic, but this is just as interesting, is this, is this event. Now, I'm not showing you the time series, and I'll play it for you. The first let me describe to you a little bit what's here. This is one of those phonograms again. Here is uh, 50 hertz, here is middle C, and here is this chirp, which now really is a chirp. And you can see it's getting higher and higher in frequency. Let me play for it, okay? I hope I can do that. Uh, this is a completely different sort. I may not be able to do it because it doesn't seem to seem. Okay, that's a shame. Oh, there we go, we got it. Like that. I was worried about the computer having not completed that. That's a real trip. And that now is a lot lighter. These are 1.4 solar mass we think. Neutron stars, very much like what you saw a Holson Taylor time. It doesn't, it's not the Holson Taylor object. There are many of them. Okay? And uh, they have to be, but that was the, the source we always hoped we would see. We didn't expect to see black holes right away because we couldn't calculate how many binary black holes there were. But we had some examples of binary neutron stars. And here, lo and behold, this thing is very close to us. It's 140 million light years away. Now, the important thing is two things. There is our detection, the gravity wave detection. We didn't quite see the thing collapse together. That would be about one kilohertz. Our signal wasn't good enough. The signal was going to hell by about 400 hertz. They're so close, they're almost touching by that time. But here is something which was that at the moment when they should have been touching, here is an output of, the, of a gamma ray telescope called Fermi, which was sitting in space. And 1.7 seconds later, between here and there, they saw a gamma ray burst. On one of their instruments, they saw it on a, another instrument, same thing, and another satellite, <coughs> a, a, a European satellite, saw it also. And this was the first piece of evidence that a gravitational wave was also seen by an electromagnetic instrument. Nobody had ever seen 
a coincidence of our black holes uh, with the electromagnetic. And it tell, you told us right away that the velocity of light and the velocity of gravitational waves are damn near the same. Because here's all you can get calculation in your head. This is 1.7 seconds between here and there, and the thing took 140 million years to get here. Okay? <laughs> so now that people make a big quibble of, well, why is it 1.7 seconds? And not exactly. That's for you guys to figure out. <laughs> so, yeah, clearly you have to get something going on in that source. It takes a while for to get the plasma working. These are two things that are neutron stars, big neutron mushes that are going on there. It's got to be, eventually they will make a big optical display. And 1.7 seconds, it could be zero that difference. But we're not claiming that, because it's part 10 to the 15 already with 1.7 seconds zero. Now, that started a whole revolution. And, uh, and here is where the fact that Virgo was on the air, but didn't see it. That's sort of amazing. They didn't see it, but we knew they were sensitive. There are patterns in the antenna pattern of a, such a detector where there is no sensitivity. And I won't go into that, but there are at 45 degrees the, the plane in which the, there is no sensitivity in the cone. That has to do with polarization of gravitational waves. That's not, you can ask me the questions if you get this. So what happens is here then is the whole story. It's again the sky. LIGO itself had this piece of uncertainty down here, that piece of uncertainty over there. Here's the uncertainty of Fermi. It's the big instrument. And then when you put in the fact that Virgo did not see it, you get this little thing right in here. That was absolutely critical because people then trained their telescopes on the ground six hours later. This is in the southern hemisphere. There's still light in the southern hemisphere. And they found, they, they found here a galaxy. And I don't, to me, I don't know quite what that galaxy is. Maybe Walter knows that galaxy. Have you ever looked at that one? No, I haven't. <laughs> not, just one of many, right? <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, so and anyway, here is a picture of the 20 days before this happened. These are stars in our own galaxy. And this is a, the, the smeared out thing is a galaxy. And there is little marks there, and you don't see a dot there. Here it is, some hours after, and here's the same stars, and here's the galaxy again, and lo and behold, there's a bright spot right there. And that just alarmed everybody, infrared astronomers, optical astronomers, UV astronomers, I mean, 300 different telescopes looked at this right away, and they made up, and I don't show all of that, but they saw an unbelievable thing. They saw the thing where now we believe, in nature, most of the heavy elements are there. Let me explain that to you. That's one thing they saw. This is a model that people have of this. And that model, by the way, is not, is not yet fixed. It keeps changing every day. If you look at after eight letters in physical review, you will find out people have new theories about this thing over and over again. Because there's still data being collected by radio astronomers and x-ray astronomers. Yeah, they're seeing the following thing. Much of this is light, but not down to detail. Here are the two neutron stars. Here's a black hole that forms because you can't put all that nuclear material. It's too heavy. It can't hold itself apart by a Fermi degeneracy pressure, and it makes a black hole. That's, and people now think they see the epic effect of the black hole. That didn't happen, by the way. And then here is often not at an angle, which is the way most of the gamma rays go, but at an angle is the gamma ray detector and it's seeing the gamma rays. And here is all the stuff in optics and everything moving away. And, and so what was done was truly something which now the NSF is very proud of. It's called multi-messenger astronomy. It's sort of the wave of the future. And I talked a little about that earlier on. That so many different methods are being used. And they tell you far more about what's really going on at that source than just one of the methods. And that's the, that has been known for years, but here is the reality of it finally coming out. And so uh, this is just a picture for Abby. And here is this thing which is the origin of the elements. I want to tell you, this was a story the astronomers could have told beautifully, and they chose not to. I don't know why not. They were busy with things that they shouldn't be busy with at the time. Uh, I told it to them quite directly. But this is a story that is unbelievable, that you have suddenly evidence of something. People had figured out that a neutron, that a, the gamma ray burst could have been due to two neutron stars colliding way back in the 70s. And here was real proof for it for the first time. The other thing that people have guessed that is that where the heavy elements are made, the very heavy elements, they're not made in stars, they're not made in the Big Bang, the Big Bang is the initial moment of the creation of the universe, 
And, uh, but uh, you can get hydrogen and helium out of that, but you don't get much else out of it. And you see this color coding. Well, here's a, PR, a periodic table for those of you who recognize it. And this color coding tells you the source at which these things were made. And most of us thought that we knew that it wasn't made in the Big Bang, possibly made in exploding stars or the supernova, and there different classes of stars, but green and yellow are sort of most of the average things. But all the things that are blue or purple in here, were not, they were not able to get high enough, long enough times in a supernova, and enough densities in a supernova to have enough neutrons to make these heavy things. And among those heavy things, uh, things we, we, try, well, we try, prize a lot is platinum and gold, and things we don't prize so much like gold, uh, uranium and tungsten and all that stuff. Or it looks like, and this is not yet completely established as far as I'm concerned, but it's about the closest we're going to get now, is that it looks like most of the heavy, very heavy things, all the purple stuff up there, was, is made in uh, such kind of collisions. The other thing, I want well, to leave this go. I, I, I want to go here. That's another thing we can talk about. Ask me later. It's a very lovely observation of the cosmology, and you can do some interesting cosmology. I want to leave that go because I'll really test your patience. Let me just say two things. Here's a picture of the noise, and I just want to tell you that here are some things that are important for those of you in the astronomy business. Here. This is where we are now in the last one we made. This is sensitivity versus frequency. Here's 100 hertz, which is the best place. And here's a detector we have last run that made all these discoveries. But here's where we ought to be, that green line. And we're not there, and that will worry us a lot. So we've been trying to fix, because every factor of two has enormous sensitivity, changes in what kind of science we can do. Then there are ideas that we have for doing better in the facilities we now have, and that would stop right about there. We have ideas to, both the Europeans and the Americans have ideas how to make better detectors. But if we really want to go into cosmology with this business, into the science of looking at the entire universe, using black holes and using neutron stars, and maybe other things that exist, but for those two we know about, you have to get down in here. And there are two ideas, the Europeans have one and the Americans have another. And these are things that are quite expensive projects. But in the United States, we're thinking about building LIGOs that are 40 kilometers long. In Europe, they're thinking of building an isosceles triangle, or an equilateral triangle under the ground. And that's 10 kilometers on the side. OK. So I, I want to go to the last slide. This is the last slide. I just want to tell you that now, these are the things that are going, going on now and things that are in the, in the future of this field. And they're dramatic. Here is frequency, and this is 10 kilohertz, this is 1 hertz, 10 minus 4 hertz, and so forth. And up here are the periods associated with this. And things are getting longer and longer periods as we go this way. And these are the strains. Uh, the strains we're sort of doing is 10 minus 20, 10 minus 25. And it, these are different instruments that are being thought about or are actually being done already. So here's LIGO, and it has a long way to go yet the improvements it can make. And it's doing one class of gravitational research. It's doing that research that is in the frequency band of, of, of what we've seen already. But then there is a satellite program which will get around that gravity gradient noise I told you about. And that's LISA. And they intend to look at great big black holes eating little things. And they, that's a very wonderful test of general relativity. Probably the best test we will ever get of general relativity is Lisa measuring a black hole that is a small black hole being eaten by a 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. And there happens to be one in the middle of our galaxy, eating away. Okay? Uh, then there's an experiment. So this is an experiment that might fly in about 2031, 23. This is an experiment that's going on already. And that's an experiment that has ambitions to look at very long period of gravitation. And what it works, the way it works is you time pulsars. You take the pulsars, the neutron stars, the very fast ones, and they hope, they hope to do the following kind of measurement. Look at pulsars in the north, look at pulsars in the south, and see that they're both going a little faster than they normally do. And look at them in the east and west, and that they're going a little slower than they used to. Be. And that means that a gravitation wave has come through and suffused through our galaxy. Okay, so they want to look for very long period of gravitation waves, which come from 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 solar mass black holes. Interesting, and they have a limit that they can't, they're limited by the number of fast pulsars they can see. And then lastly is an experiment that is, I think, the most interesting to me, and maybe you, well, I'll try to say, but I can't do, I cannot do justice in the, in the one minute I have to tell you what it is, but it's a, looking in an attribute 
of the cosmic background radiation, looking at the polarization of that. And if there were primeval gravitational waves, if there were such a thing that came before effectively the big explosion, right? I mean, and and I and the uh, and, and he will tell you that I'm full of it, okay? <laughs> but he so let me have my turn. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and he's right. He may have a wonderful idea. Okay. And uh, so the so the thing is that that there, if there are primeval gravitational waves, they will have caused perturbations in the plasma of that that generates that cosmic background that gives it a polarization pattern that looks like a pinwheel. You look in there, you'll see pinwheel patterns in the polarization. Those are called B modes, and there are many experiments now doing that. They made a premature announcement. Uh, three, four years ago, where they thought they had seen this, and what they were really seeing is cosmic dust in our own galaxy doing the same thing. So I did it. Those experiments have been vastly improved, and I expect that within the next five years, that's my guess, there will be an answer if they see something or they don't see something. And at a level of about 0.01, in the, so this is for the experts, the ratio of the tensor part, which is the gravitational wave bearing part, to the scalar part, which is just the temperature fluctuations that come about in the natural evolution of the universe at that time. There's a thing that they have to quite. And that ratio, right now, they're, they, they just published a paper that said it's less than 0.5. And, uh, and now it's point, uh, point, they hope to get 0.01 in about five years. And in 10 years, they hope to get to 0.00. That's about as far as you Thank you very much. So, <laughs>
And what, what's the difference between that and the stuff you've seen is the second go of the data. It was a reanalysis of the data. They found more five sigma sources in there. They have to do something like that. So it turns out, typically, we're seeing an event in the month. Okay? At a distance of 0.1 z, or nine times, 1 times 10 to 9 uh, light years away. So as you increase the number, suppose you go to 2 times 10 minus 9, you've got 8 times more volume. Right? So we will see one every half a week. That's sort of what we're hoping will be the case for now, that we hope we've gotten the design test. We don't know that for a fact. And all these improvements, every one of those improvements, uh, improvement of the factor of 2, the factor of every improvement in distance, as you can go, which is the instance of, I said this to many people, but it, it, the, the, what we feel, what we measure is the field amplitude, which is not the field power, it's the square root of the power. Okay? So it turns out that a linear increase in amplitude is a linear improvement in the distance that you can see, and that's then a cubic improvement in the number of sources. By the way, we've only seen one neutron star binary. We've only Ready during the 40 years that we will know my team. You have educated me, and we have had countless discussions about your weather and about your LIGO. There's one thing, however, that you never told me, and that is also the reason why Joe rejected those three events. You said that you have a theory. Oh, about weather? Yeah. Okay, I can tell you what that was. Well, you, since you're at MIT, by the way, UConn has exactly the same thing MIT does. They use uh, undergraduates for a lot of stuff. Exactly the right MIT is even later, maybe later than UConn, I don't know. But it's a great thing to do to undergraduate. It's the best experience you can give an undergraduate. And I had an undergraduate, his name was Mickey Gordon, he turned into a surgeon later. Okay, not so far from you. And, uh, the, uh, I, he and I, this was in my early days, during the Weber days, after we made some coils about this big, that high. We wrapped them, and we put one in my house in Newton, one at MIT in the lab in Building 20, and one at Argonne Laboratory, right near Weber's bar, without really telling them that people probably saw. <laughs> and uh, what we did is we, uh, what was this, and we had a little circuit we built, that would look for magnetic pulses. And I saw, and Mickey and I, it's in his thesis, you know, his bachelor's thesis. We saw three, four, five events a day. Coincident between Argonne, my lab, and, and Newton. And they were 10 to the minus three gauss, 10 to the minus three second pulses. Magnetic pulses. And what are they from? Typically, they are thunderstorms. They're going on all the time, even in the winter. And it turns out that that's what I thought, and what was that doing to his bar? That's all you need. He had this bar, it's probably not very well shielded, because he wasn't that careful. He was very, he was very imaginative, but he, I wouldn't trust the experiments he did. And, 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 and so what happened was that you take an uh, aluminum bar, which is a very good conductor, and try to squeeze it with a 10 to minus 3 gauss, 10 to minus 3 second pulse, and you double, you get squeezing, and you will get 10 to the minus 14 strain. That's what I thought. I, since I knew him pretty well, I went and presented this to him. And typical, it was, what do you think, I'm a fool? I know that. And I never got a real answer. <laughs> no, because they did a better job. They did a better job of shielding things. And they knew better their instrument than, than Joe did. But look, you have to be careful. I, I, mean, I have endless talks with Virginia Trimble about this. You may know. Uh, Virginia, Virginia became the second wife, and, and is very proud of it. So, and I am too. The fact that he did what he did was admirable, and it was very imaginative. The only thing is I wish he had more people who worked with him. See, the people who worked with him didn't argue with him. I think that was the problem. That's really, yeah. I'm just curious, um, what do you think about the, the nature of imagination? Nature of imagination? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the question. Uh, I'll tell you, you're, I, I'll answer you, but not answer you in the way you asked. 
I mean, I think that there's different ways of doing science. Some people are very, very careful in analytics. There's some people who are sort of wild and sort of blue-haired and run up and they have this wonderful idea, but they don't know quite how to implement it sometimes. And it, those people who are very analytic and maybe not quite as wild could work together with the ones who are wild and not analytic. You would get much more science. It's the best I can answer. You can't just be magical. You've got to have a little substance. <laughs> Gravitational when you travel through many different temperature environments. Oh, yeah. Did you say something about the sure. sun and gravity? Yeah, and I, the gravitational. I, I, I'm going to answer you very simply. His question is how does, can I broaden your question a little bit? How does gravitational waves interact with the things that go through? Well, they interact with the things that go through. Is that okay? Would that be a big answer? Yeah. Well, they interact with the things that go through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It turns out that uh, there is an, an interaction of the gravitational waves. And this is just, it turns out, you have to make some numbers with the theory together to get a proper answer if you want to do it for yourself. This is, I can say something, but it's really dependent on the numbers. In the, in the, here, when you talk about light, now let me give you an example and then you'll see where. When you talk light having an index for attraction, when you talk about that, you talk about light going through material or atoms or whatever's in the way, and there is an interaction that you know about. It makes an index for attraction. And what it is, be careful, how do you calculate that? If you really want to do the basic principles, you calculate the electric field in the light wave, calculate the induced dipole moment in the atom, and then look at that and let it re-radiate its own waves. There'll be 90 degrees out of phase with the main exciting wave. And you add that to the way that you already have it, it looks like the light is going slow. So the reason why there's an index for a fraction and there's an interaction at all is because the system it goes through re-radiates the, it scatters the wave. Okay, now if you do the same thing in gravity waves, you can do the, you, you can do the, get the quadrupole formula, it's not that hard to find. That's the formula Einstein did in 1918. Don't even bother to correct the factor of two error you made in that, that's not important. And now calculate the amount of quadrupole you get, which is the deseparation of matter, as a gravitational wave goes through it it'll cause some separation in the, in, in the matter. And that will oscillate along with the gravitational wave and will also re-radiate. And in principle, it should do something. But when you put the numbers to paper, it's just, it's just absolutely tiny. And so it turns out that when you do that calculation, you find out that a gravitational wave could start from the Earth and get out to, if you could do it, to the z of uh, 10 to the, you know, 10 to the 5, and nothing has happened. And that's why it's so powerful to do gravitational waves. It's fun. Because it lets you look into all things you can't do with electromagnetic waves. It never scatters. But you have to prove that to yourself by doing that part. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. It's really interesting. Uh, I have a question for you uh, that uh, once you detect the signals uh, in your lab, how do you determine what the source of it is and where they are? Okay. I know that's very important. But yeah, what he's asking is how do we get the physics out of the way? That's what we're And uh, well, all right, that's a somewhat long story. And I, again, uh, I'm amazed at you guys that you had the zits by to stick around. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the, the thing is that the, the data analysis is done, you have to look at the different pieces of it. And I didn't describe that because I was talking to a general audience, but it's quite elegant. But I, the most important development you have is that you have two detectors. And now we have three, and by the time this really gets done, we'll have probably five or six. And the fact is that you're asking for the same signal in all of these in very different places. That tells you that, first of all, it's probably not a local phenomenon. Okay? Certainly not a ground noise. It's not a local people tramping around and stuff like that. So that's very important. Coincidence experiments. And by the way, I'll tell you right off. The signal that comes out of these detectors is very non-Gaussian. You would be very horrified looking at it. And that's one of the reasons we're very worried about publishing this data for everybody to play with. I mean, we are now obliged to do that. The NSF has demanded that all that data go public. Uh, but, and uh, what, the way we get rid of it is through a whole set of different things. We demand that we see the same thing at all the sites with time delays that are appropriate. Okay? We have to solve for that because we don't know where it comes from. We, have to, we then demand that it not be in one of something like 15 channels that are measuring the environment. 
crowd noise, particle pits, from, you know, cosmic rays, magnetometers, a whole bunch of this, a whole assembly at each mass of environmental detectors. And if it's on those, we veto it. And then there's something like 10,000 signals that come out of the instrument and are inside of it, like the frequency stability of the laser, the amplitude stability of the laser. And it's unbelievable how much effort has gone with it. And I could never afford a thing like this myself. You have complete control of the experiment by looking at all the ancillary signals that are coming out of all sorts of places in the, in the experiment. And you can't have those things be anomalous at the time when they take. So, okay, so those are all the pieces. So you first have to establish that it's something that came from the outside. And you believe the data is not some piece of noise. Then, once you have it, and you begin to look at it, you do the very simple things first. You go to Newton's formula. Do it just, and that's what we did with the black hole. We looked at that and said, yeah, well, you can solve, uh, let's try different masses. And you'll see that 30 solar masses was about appropriate. When these things are far apart, Newton's law works fine. And also, uh, the quantum pole formula works fine when it, Einstein developed in, tw in, in 2018. And then, finally, when you get to the point you think you've narrowed it down to it's not a neutron star, it could be a black hole, it's just, then you go to numerical relativity and you say, now, in those days, we asked them to run various cases. Now, because it's so easy to do, they run thousands and thousands of cases. And you compare the templates that are associated with all the different things. What are the variables you have? You have the masses of the two holes. You have the spin of the, of the two holes. You have the aspect of the, of the orbit. And you have the other things. You have the calibration of your apparatus. And you know, once you know a little bit about the model, all you have to do is measure the strain that you measure. And Know that the system has those masses in it. You get within a factor of about five the distance to the source right away. Okay, and so you know because we measure the strain, and if you know the masses, you know by Einstein's formula what how big the source was at the you know, how big is the source as a strain as a gravitational wave source at the source. So, and and you'll notice this people who look at other the, the telegrams we sent out, you'll find that. We, we sent the telegram out immediately now because of the very interesting thing that happened with the neutron star. If I had been delayed by another day, people would have missed a lot of very important things in science. So now we're trying to get out right away if we can, but you accept a little more uncertainty. And as the days go on after that, the uncertainty gets unraveled and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And people have to get used to that. Okay, I think I've answered your question. It's a multi-step process. Okay, and in thanking uh, Professor Weiss, I wanted to comment that exactly a year ago I was visiting CERN on the day when you announced the neutron star merger uh, experiment, the result, and we were called in, we were told there's going to be a closed circuit press conference and someone who's not in the dark matter camp said, oh God, don't tell me they found dark matter. Mercifully, <laughs> 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 they had not <laughs> So what they found was something much more exciting. And one of the things... Bill doesn't like dark energy. Nor does he like dark energy. And um, one of the things that I did not learn from that announcement, and that's what Professor Weiss has mentioned, is they did announce that they, the optical people had detected gold. And the person who introduced the whole, whole event said, and this is where the gold in your watch is comes from very excited. And I didn't understand this because I always thought that all the other... And the mush, they, uh, what the mush is just, you see an opacity. You know, you see a thing which looks like it's a little red, and, 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 but you can't see a line in it. And what was done is people have, like, Met, like Metzger, Ryan Metzger, has done a very careful, but only do so well, calculation of all that mess of elements. What would they look like if you couldn't resolve the lines? He's taken all the tables of lines and even extended them where there are no lines in the tables and said, what would this thing look like if it was going at close to the velocity of light? And that is a model that he published in, in uh, AppJ, I think. And that's what's used to see some very broad bumps in the kilometer. And I'm waiting, and I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the thing to cool off enough so that they can begin to see lines. I mean, that's the, to me, it's a, I was, when I, I was told the same thing you were. Oh, they've seen gold lines. I said, come on, really? I mean, real, and how, where is it? UV, where, where, where? And it turns out in the end, no, they saw broad band of 
Now, that doesn't make it wrong, but it isn't quite as solid as seeing the atomic one. Look, I have to say that. <laughs> Nonetheless, whether, whether or not they saw gold lines, they, 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 they certainly saw gravitational radiation and uh, gravitational waves, not gravity waves. And <laughs> we certainly thank Professor Weiss for a very